Welcome to Shoreline Podcast. I'm here. I'm your host today, Keith Kruger, and I'm hanging out with Pastor Kevin Harney, and we're doing something a little bit different this time. We've got a special Christmas episode. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of Christmas tradition, a little bit of Santa Claus, and we're going to throw some theology in there because that's really what it's all about. Um, welcome, and we're going to have a good time. Yeah. Let's chat. All right, Kevin. So let's start right off the bat. Christmas is a a lot about traditions. Yeah. Do you personally have any favorite Christmas tradition or traditions? Yeah, because I grew up in a home that had no faith and our all of our traditions were uh, were completely non-faith based. Um, one of our traditions was everyone gave everyone a gift. And so we would get, uh, this is an old thing, but we would, we would go to a place called pick and save. If you've been oh, yes. around a while, pick and save, you get meaningful stuff for a quarter or so. And so I, I'd get like, a, I think I had a $10 budget to buy maybe 40 gifts. And so you do the math on that one. And so lots of, uh, you know, fancy pencil sharpeners, erasers, um, cheap mugs, whatever. And so, uh, but I, I do love the give, the exchanging of gifts and, and hopefully as time has gone on, I've gotten better gifts for people. Did you get any of those gifts for yourself that you really liked? I was going to say, I got a lot of useless garbage. Yeah. <laughs> I got lots of useless stuff at Christmas uh, and, uh, and then got some wonderful gifts too. Yeah. Cool. So what are some traditions that you would say that maybe miss the mark and don't, mm -hmm. don't really fit in with what you think would be yeah. the best way to celebrate Christmas? Well, I'd say I don't have any problem with almost any tradition that's just kind of a neutral, fun tradition, whether it's from, you know, from eggnog to uh, to Christmas trees, to lights, to family gas. I mean, those are those are all neutral or nice, fun things. I would say my only concern with traditions is when our traditions that we've created around Christmas uh, supplant and push away mm -hmm. what it's really about. And so if people say, well, Christmas for, for, for me is really family and food and exchanging gifts and, and lights and driving around looking at homes that are decorated. You go, great, mm -hmm. but isn't there something more? And the answer is there's a whole lot more. So my, my, my thing is more, I'm just cautious when, when all the other traditions that have nothing to do with Jesus are enough, mm -hmm. when they're really not. There's so much more. Yeah, I, for me personally, I've for years had uh, an opposition to all of those. Like I didn't even yeah. want to decorate my house yeah. because I felt like that's going to get in the way. Yeah. Um, and I think you're right. It, it yeah. doesn't get in the way if you don't let it get in the way. Yeah. It can be supplemental. It can be an added nicety. Yeah. Um, but I used to always fight against it because it's not yeah. about yeah. that. It's not and that's, about the life. And that's and that's part of your temperament. You're a warrior and you love that kind of stuff. But and yeah. I and I think I've I've had some of that in me through the years. But what I've realized is if those things are neutral and nice, mm -hmm. no problem. If those things own the day, then it is a problem. And then you have to decide how you're gonna handle it. Well, I've got to tell you, I've now embraced the whole house decorating thing. And so I've got nativity scenes all over the place and uh, I try to make the message more yeah. about Jesus, yeah. but it, it works out well that way. You got the glow in the dark flashing Jesus oh, in the manger. Do. There you go. <laughs> how about Santa Claus? Like, how, how, how did, how did how you, about Santa Claus? How did you handle Santa yeah. Claus in yeah. your home with your boys? Well, I grew up, I grew up with, and, and we should probably have a spoiler alert if you have children uh, watching the podcast right now. And if you're worried about your children, uh, 10 seconds to move them out of the room, because I'm just going to speak my mind here. Seven seconds, clear them on out plug their ears and go. Uh, so in, in my upbringing, we had Santa Claus, but I never bought it. Just didn't buy it. I, I've been a bit of a rational empiricist since the start. And so I ask a lot of, I ask a lot of questions and push back on things. So I never bought into it. I knew it wasn't uh, a real deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but with our kids, we decided early on, we told our kids, hey, listen, Santa's not real. It's just kind of a fun thing, and uh, so you're not going to get gifts from Santa because we don't want some uh, some chubby chubby guy who's never around getting credit for our gifts, anyways, right? So we, we said we're not you're not going to get gifts from Santa. You get gifts from us, and and we said then you can't tell your friends that Santa isn't real because uh, for them it's fun in a different way, and that's maybe all they got. And so uh, we we had our boys not talk about it with their friends. We said it's not a real thing, but it's sort of a fun thing that people do. And we kind of made it a festive holiday thing, but we never uh, we didn't have to explain to our kids later on when they go, what, you were lying to us? We didn't have right. to go through that process. I yeah. remember early on in my life, uh, I was in the bathroom at Christmas Eve, and I just happened to wonder, why is the shower curtain pulled? And I pulled back the shower curtain. Santa Claus the was there? The <laughs> bathtub was full of gifts. Yeah, no Santa Claus. Yeah. 
And so I figured it out pretty early. I'm like, okay. All right. This is yeah. not Santa Claus. Actually, a big guy with a beard taking a bath. I thought that'd be kind of, be kind of creepy. Yeah. A little bit. So, any... And by the way, that comment was for Thomas over here who's having a great time putting our pot. Hey, Thomas. <laughs> Do you have any advice for parents on how they handle Santa with their family? their kids you know i my general approach to those things is to say you know do what you think works best for your family but but i would say my one caution would be if you're really selling the santa thing hard if you're really selling it hard and you're like no santa's real santa's real uh and you do and you're a christian family and jesus is real jesus is real then when you tell them santa's not real um it can be well is what else is what else were you lying to me about what else were you um making up stories about and so uh, i would say if you're going to do the Santa thing, Santa thing, keep it fun. But the moment your kids ask you a question, say, oh, you know, really, you know, listen, honey, it's, it's, it's just a fun thing. Uh, but it's, you know, but the gifts are from us and, and it's really about Jesus. And I think it just bring it back, bring it back to what it's all about. It's about Jesus. And I think the best we can, but, but I, I think have fun with, you know, lights are beautiful and, uh, and family gatherings are fun and, and exchanging gifts, uh, learning generosity and, a, and being thankful for the gifts. Those are all things that are kind of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, and we'll get to kind of the main thing, but the main thing is Jesus. Yeah. Well, and as we go back to one of what the main thing is, um, one of the, I think, most common, not most common, a very common uh, Christmas tradition is going to church. Yeah. Christmas Eve, Christmas, yeah. um, but then often not throughout the rest yeah. of the year. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Why, why do you think yeah. that happens? Yeah, we go to church faithfully once a year, whether we need it or not, right? Or maybe twice a year, we might sneak in <laughs> an Easter? Easter service there. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think that for people who say that one of our traditions, one of our things we do is that we go to Christmas Eve services. Um, I would say for even for people who might be listening to this, that, that that's kind of their routine. I would say, make it bigger than that. Um, there's some, there's something about the rhythm of gathering with God's people of celebrating his goodness. And it's funny if somebody comes every Christmas and then they, they say to the pastor, you always preach about the same stuff. It's like, well, it's Christmas Eve. We're going to be talking about the manger and Jesus. It's, you know, but, but I think that, um, gathering with God's people is one of the markers of spiritual maturity. This idea of consistent community being together, uh, build that into your lifestyle and, and yes, make it a tradition to go to Christmas Eve services and, and to Easter services, uh, but also make it a rhythm of life together with God's people in worship and, and just make it bigger than that. So that's a good tradition. Yeah. What other traditions would you say would be good? Maybe for mm -hmm. Christians who haven't um, built in any faith-based yeah. traditions, what yeah. would be some traditions for Christians yeah. to, uh, to instill? Maybe start yeah. this year for yeah. the first time. Well, one simple thing we've done for years and years and still do it is we always will do a, a reading, a, a, a scripture reading of the Christmas story. Or even this last Thanksgiving, we had uh, we had some of our kids uh, with us, and uh, we were able to be with two of our sons and their wives. And so, um, I laid out a reading from some of the Psalms of Thanksgiving, and I assigned some to Christine, and some to Zach, and some to Nate, and some to Bryn. And Cohen, who's not reading yet, I had him like repeat some <laughs> lines, but I actually had his dad read some lines, and I had him repeat it. And then Sharon and I each read part, and we just we just opened the Word of God together around Thanksgiving. Do that around Christmas. Do that around special holidays that have a sacred meaning to them and uh, and don't and don't just uh you know uh, torture your family by you reading it slowly every year Get, let invite them to be a part of it and say hey who will take the first you know three verses who'll take this and um and so with with my family i just assigned everybody once and i gave them a sheet with their name on it what they were going to read and what order it was in and nobody said i'm not doing this it's, i'm protesting we just it, and i would even say if you're gathering with family and some aren't believers they probably have some idea that there's a sacred nature to Christmas, right. that there's something about Jesus involved there. Uh, they see the nativity scenes in your, in your front lawn, you know, maybe three or four <laughs> nativity scenes would be exciting. But, uh, and so, and so um, sometimes inviting people into those moments, even before they're believers in Christ can begin to open up questions and thoughts about that. And, and then I think also uh, to, to bring prayer into your, into your gatherings around the holidays and to say, um, let, let's just pray and, and thank, thank God for coming among us. Thank Jesus for coming with us and then giving his life for us. And, and just think about those things that you can pray for. So bring the scriptures in, bring prayer in. And I think remind people what the holiday really is about. And, and I would say this too, not dogmatically, not with anger, mm -hmm. not resentfully, not wagging a finger and saying look how you do it wrong and i'm doing it right that's that's not helpful for anybody uh, it's never helpful and particularly in our in our polarized climate it's not helpful but 
but just to say, boy, let's let's spend a little time and think about this together. Let's talk about this together. And people that are believers will, I think, really appreciate it. And those who aren't, they kind of go, wow, that's... I, I've had people say, that, that was kind of neat. I really like that. Neat's a good start. And that neat's a good start, yeah. Yeah. So gifts are a big part mm -hmm. of Christmas. And Shoreline mm -hmm. has this thing called First Gift. Yeah. Um, what is the first gift all about? Yeah. That's a tradition. You know, we're talking about traditions, right? Uh, that's a tradition that was part of Shoreline before I came. And I think it's beautiful. I really, and I'm not entirely sure who came up with it and what motivated them. And it doesn't really matter to me. What matters is there's a beauty to every Christmas season to pause and say, what's our first gift going to be? And for Sherry and I now every year, our first gift, and we always say, we I've started to say our first gift and our best gift mm. uh, is for Jesus. And to me, that's the idea of first gift is to say, it's, we're celebrating his birth, his life, his goodness and grace. So let's give a gift. Well, you say, well, how do you give a gift to Jesus? Um, you say, well, give your whole life. Yeah, that's true, but let's get more tangible, right? <laughs> um, if you're going to give a financial gift, uh, for us at Shoreline, we give it to the coming year's outreach, global outreach, community outreach, national outreach, what, what we're doing to share God's love with our community. So we're giving Jesus the gift of fulfilling what he told us to do, and that is to share his love with others. And so I, I love it. And and Sherry and I, this last Sunday, um, gave a gave a really great gift to Jesus to, through Shoreline Church. And there will be people who will hear about the love of Jesus this year, 2022, coming up, because Sherry and I gave our first gift to Jesus. And I, I think that's really exciting. That can't be... Uh... Yeah overstated how, yeah. how big an impact that that yeah. has the potential yeah. is absolutely amazing yeah what's the greatest gift you've ever gotten can you remember yeah i give you two okay. the, the the big and obvious one is my first christmas that i knew jesus the christmas when i was 16 years old i didn't i didn't know jesus i didn't grow up with any spiritual heritage really that i had any recollection of so my first christmas that i understood who jesus was that was the greatest gift my greatest uh, tangible gift i remember is i remember getting wasn't a 10 speed bike it was a like a 15 Whoa, speed bike it was yeah. like this really cool bike got it for christmas and a really good lock and i remember going to the bo local bowling alley i don't think i was bowling i think i was playing pinball and I parked my new bike, this was the next week, and I put my lock on it and locked it up. And I came out later and it was gone. And we called the police and filed a report because those were back in the days when the police would show up and actually file a report. <laughs> and um, they said, we usually don't find these things, but sometimes they show up again and it never did. And the way my family worked, it was, I had the bike for maybe four or five, six days. It was still Christmas break when, I, when it was stolen. And my dad said, that's too bad. And they didn't go buy me another bike. They didn't, uh, there was no insurance program on it. It was just like that. He said, oh, you feel bad that you lost, that you don't have the bike anymore. But that was back in the day, man. <laughs> it was kind of like, I thought, okay. And I and I, I was walking again. So I, it was a great gift for like four or five days. That's the, that's my sorrow, sorrowful, sad Christmas story. That's a but, terrible story. Yeah. I've had a bike stolen as well, <laughs> but mine wasn't locked up. Mine was just my uh, yeah. negligence. And yeah. I put it out in front of round table pizza and I yeah. came back out and it wasn't there. Yeah. I don't know why I was surprised, but yeah. I understand the pain. Like it's did, did, anybody re did anybody replace your bike for you? No, there you go. did not. Welcome was, to life. It was School me. of Hard Knocks 101. <laughs> well, Christmas, we've already hinted, is about something yeah. different than these traditions. Yeah. yeah. For you, what what is, what's at the heart of Christmas? Yeah. What is it yeah. really all about? Yeah. You know, the, I, and I preached about this this last Sunday. The I think the theological word that's so powerful is incarnation, that, that God came among us that God moved in. Uh, there's a there's a loose translation. People call it a, a, a loose paraphrase, not a translation. Mm -hmm. The message, some people call it a translation. It's not. It's a paraphrase. But um, in in the in the message, it talks about in the incarnation that he that Jesus moved into our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That picture, he kind of moved in next door. He came near to us. So in Christmas, Jesus came among us. God, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, but not just that he came among us 2,000 years ago, that when we put our faith in him now, because of the life he lived and the death he gave for us and his resurrection and his ascension, if we receive him, he moves into our lives. And so to me, Christmas is that that God is here with us. Mm -hmm. Initially, over 2,000 years ago, but every moment of every day when we put our faith in Jesus. And so Christmas is all about Jesus, his intimacy, his closeness, that he is with us, he is in us, that he loves us, and that God came near. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you just said 2,000 years ago when he yeah. actually came. Do you have any thoughts on why God chose that time, yeah. that place, yeah. that setting yeah. um, to reveal himself in that way? Yeah, yeah. Well, the theological answer, 
which I'll give you. And then my personal answer, the theological answer is in the fullness of time that God, that God in his sovereign wisdom looked and said in the fullness of time, this is the time for the Messiah to come. The Messiah was prophesied through, through all through the old Testament, just masses of passages pointing to his arrival, his life, his death, how he would die, how he would come into Jer- Jerusalem, all these things that together that show this, this prophetic um, kind of voice saying the Messiah is going to come. Uh, but I, th- my sense of to that place in the world, um, it seems like a strange, but Bethlehem specifically, a little, a little backwater town, but in the history of the world at that time with the Roman world, there was connection that didn't exist before. There was connection of roads that didn't exist before. There was connection of communication. There was connection of travel uh, that in, in, in Rome, in ancient Rome, it was dangerous to travel on roads sometimes but there was a sense of safety because mm. of the the pax romana the, the the peace of rome and the peace of rome was bought with a lot of blood and the peace of rome was guarded with a lot of power but there was a sense of the world was connected and so the gospel then when the gospel the good news of jesus came and jesus entered human history in that part of the world when the apostle paul came along and was his life was transformed and he began to share the message of jesus and start churches there was an ability to travel move and share the story of jesus in a much broader sense than, than it could have been before. Now you say, well, why didn't Jesus wait until now when we have uh, right. Twitter, you know, um, <laughs> which is its own uh, conversation of, of the demonic power of the, of the, uh, of social media, which we won't get into that right now. But Thomas, maybe we can do a, we can do a podcast on the demonic power of social media. I'm, I'm only partly teasing, but I am partly teasing. I'm, uh, I'm in. He's in. Okay, great. <laughs> um, but, but you go, well, now we have even better, ability to communicate mm-hmm. and that's great we, we use these tools like this for the podcast to right. share the story of jesus um but it seems like historically with the advent of rome with roman rule with roman roads with roman um policing and all of that meant there was a way to then that that message could then be disseminated and moved throughout the world in a way that it really had never been before and i think that that's my thought looking at the historical context of of God's wisdom in, in the fullness of time of bringing Jesus into that time and that place in such a way that the message would go out. That's just my own opinion. I, yeah. I, that's really intriguing. Like, yeah. There's like an equilibrium of yeah. you know early enough that yeah. people can learn about it, but yeah. Yeah. late yeah. enough that it can actually get out there. Yeah, yeah, it's an intriguing thought. Yeah. Uh, the other day I went to a uh, real life nativity scene christmas story and there were angels dancing all over the place and i know our preschool here is putting on a little performance and there's going to be angels all over the place and then you can look in the bible yeah and there's lots of angels in this story why do you think angels were such a prevalent or large Hmm. part of the christmas story yeah well an interesting thing is that the word angel actually just means messenger Mm -hmm. we think of you know when we think of angel we think about wings and flying and all the angel-y stuff you know and and there's different times even in my own lifetime where angels have become very popular and there's angel calendars and and then they kind of angels kind of ebb and flow in their popularity but but angels are messengers Mm -hmm. and so so i think that and especially the coming of jesus at, at the advent the coming the incarnation there were announcements announcements that Mary you'll be with child, announcements that uh, a, a child will be born here, announcements that the child is born into the, the shepherds, go go here. And so, you know, angel, uh, angel's primary job is to bring a message. They're messengers and they come from, from the presence of the throne of God. And they, they, I think the angels have other stuff in their job description, but a primary one is to bring messages from God. And so I think to announce, to declare the coming of the, the Messiah born into human history. And so there's lots of angels at that time in history because God's getting the word out and he's sending his messengers to do that. That's yeah. neat. Yeah. So something deep like that, we'll go to something really light now. Yeah. How does God fit into a baby and remain God at the same time? Well, super light, it's right? Very, it's very, very <laughs> tricky. It involves a magic potion. <laughs> no, it's a, it, that is something that, that uh, theologians have grappled with since Forever. the first century and will until Jesus returns again. And uh, there's a word in, in Philippians chapter two and what's called the great Christ hymn of, of, of kind of an early hymn sung in the church. And the, the, the Greek word is kenosis, that he emptied himself. So there's this, this picture of, G, uh, of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, eternally God, came among us to somehow step into human flesh, to be in flesh, to be incarnate among us. It says he emptied himself and yet he still 
held on to his divinity. And so my my the quickest answer is I have no idea how it how it really works. Um, a little bit longer answer than that would be that that the the kind of classic characteristics of, of God's um, omnipotence, God's omnipresence. He can be everywhere all the time. God, God is all present, all places, all, all times. Um, in some sense, it was almost like Jesus set that aside. He was in flesh. He was in one place at one time. But his, his character, his divinity um, didn't change. And so how that works, I can't fully explain. And yet what we understand theologically is that, that, that when God came among us, Emmanuel, God with us, when he was born to a virgin, you know, in the womb of a virgin, uh, as an embryo. I mean, we're not, don't even think, don't even think baby. Right. Think about, you know, before then. this baby was growing inside of her. So smaller than the baby. And yet there is somehow the fullness of God's divine character and being was within Jesus. But Jesus, until he rose from the dead, he wasn't walking through walls and appearing from place to place to place. He was limited in time and space. Um, when he, as a baby, when he was born, he needed the nutrition he got from his mother. Mm -hmm. He, like every human baby, needed milk to drink. You go, man, how does how does that work? And I, I often think that the heavenly beings must have looked on and just gone, <laughs> "What, <laughs> what is, is God? What is God <laughs> doing here?" You know, and you know, to even you know, shake their heads in wonder, like, "How can this be?" And yet, we also know that Jesus was fully divine because he came to pay the price for the sins of all people, and to do that, to pay the price. Uh, for an offense against the divine God demanded a, a payment that was equal to the task and only God could do that. Yeah. Now you touched on this earlier, but I think it's important. So I don't want to speed by it. Yeah. You talked a little bit about being around some non-believers during yeah. Christmas time yeah. and how they'll say, Hey, that was nice. Um, but I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on maybe mm -hmm. how, when we gather around Christmas, um, we can bring in some of yeah. the, the the joy and the beauty and the yeah. um, the real meaning of Christmas, yeah. maybe as an opportunity to to share the yeah. true meaning, the gospel, yeah. Yeah. the hope yeah. that that's in Jesus. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's, it's not theoretical for me because I when I became a believer, I was one of only two Christians in an extended family of I think close to a hundred people, all mm. connected through marriage wow. and all that. And we had uh, an elderly person in the family that was a believer. My sister Gretchen had become a Christian, and then there was me. And since then, many others have become Christians, which, you know, by God's grace, um, is wonderful. But um, but I think that I'm just trying to buy, go go back to the question again. I just want to know how we can really build in the the joy and the beauty and the meaning of Christmas to to then use as an opportunity yeah. to to yeah. to share. Jesus how do you want to pick that up, people? Thomas? Do you want to? Um, uh, let's pick that. I started thinking about my fa all my family members that become Christians, <laughs> and I was going through, through going through that list, and then my brain went over there. So let's pick it up right after Keith asked the question, the question because that yeah. was on this wide angle, so I can just cut here. Yeah, and act like if you want to re-ask the question, sure. that's fine, and then just and I'll cut yeah. and add this. Give me just a reader, just because because your question yeah. won't be in the thing; it'll be my only my response. He's not going to. Oh, capture. gotcha. Yeah. So. Um, I said you touched on this earlier, yeah. and uh, I don't want to just speed right past yeah. it. How do we um, connect people yeah. to this extra story? Yeah. So when yeah. we uh, gather with yeah. people, both believers and unbelievers, yeah. how can we uh, bring the joy and the beauty yeah. and the meaning yeah. into into our celebrations? You know, that's that is a relevant question for me because I grew up in a non-believing home with only a couple of Christians when I first became a Christian. Since then, uh, many more have become Christians, which I'm deeply grateful for. But through the years. Um, I tried lots of different little, just little practical ways to kind of bring Jesus and the meaning of Christmas into family gatherings and gatherings with friends that weren't believers at the time and some still aren't believers. And here's what I found out that's interesting. Uh, when Jesus said um, in Matthew chapter nine, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Um, Jesus was saying, listen, share your faith, be a little bit more bold because people are more open than you think. I don't think I've had, ever had a family member or, or a friend push back around Christmas time if I wove a little bit of Jesus into it. Mm -hmm. I think they kind of expect that. If you love Jesus, if you know Jesus, they expect, well, that's what you believe. But um, So it might be a matter of just saying, hey, listen, when we're together as a family, uh, I'd love just to read uh, a little a little four minute, I'd give people a time, time, you know, three minute or four minute little reading uh, about the meaning of Christmas. And uh, you don't even have to say it's from the Bible, it's just, you know, right. about the, what, the, what the Christmas story is really about. Would that be okay? You can share that way. Say, hey, when we're having a meal, I'd love to offer a prayer. Uh, just... Um, just a prayer of thankfulness for, for Christmas and really what this season's really all about. 
And many people, when they hear that prayer or they hear the scripture read, they'll, they'll, go, they'll go, that was that was neat. Or um, it's interesting, oftentimes when you pray with people who don't pray often, they get teary and almost yeah. emotional. And I think the spirit of God kind of shows up and they feel something different and they're like, it creates a curiosity. We're so nervous that we're going to offend everybody yeah. or that they're going to shut things down that we don't even ask. And I'm even finding myself more and more these days when I'm talking with somebody who's not a believer and they share a deep pain, particularly a deep pain. Um, I'll often just say, I would just love to pray right now for a moment for that. And and people are just like, sure. And I just go right into prayer and I don't get all overly religious and preachy, but I pray, I always pray in Jesus's name. So I think to bring prayers at that time of the year to talk about the meaning, I wouldn't make Christmas a time for apologetical debate where I'm going right. to prove you wrong and this is all wrong and I'm right. That's There's enough um, tension in the world right, right now without us turning Christmas into our battleground. But I think to say, hey, would it be okay if I shared this? Would it be okay if I read this? Um, most people are going to go, yeah, that'd be nice. Mm. And because so much of what we do is kind of fluffy and surfacey, it just takes things a little bit deeper. And I think people's hearts are kind of longing for that. Absolutely agree with you yeah. on that. And there's a lot of intersection between Christians and Christmas and mm -hmm. culture and Christmas. And yeah. we talked about Santa and different things like that. Um, do you have any concerns about what's happening with Christmas in our culture today? Yeah, probably my deepest concern is that like almost everything in our culture, because our culture is designed to be consumer centered, right. um, is that when Christmas just becomes all about the new toy, the new gift, the new thing, and we really get, and, and, and this is that my concern is for, particularly for Christian families, uh, for Christian uh, people who let themselves get so caught up in the what gift am I going to get or what gift am I going to give? Or for two months after Christmas, I'm leveraged financially because my credit cards are maxed out because I wasn't wise about my choices. Um, is this really what it's all about? Yes, I understand that that there were wise men and then they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I understand that gifts are part of it. But, but we've been sold a, a bill of goods when it comes to the fact that it's all about the gifts. And so I think that um, and we're in a time where, you know, still at least this Christmas, people have some money. <laughs> we'll find out next year by next Christmas how, you know, how much, but I think that people will be getting lots of nice gifts and stuff. But I, I'm just concerned that it becomes about about the gift instead of the, the gift of Jesus that came, uh, the one who came among us. And so uh, I would just say to people, be careful of the commercialism and being sucked in too much to letting your heart, your mind, and your time be all about the gifts, but, but really let it be about the gift of Jesus. So how do we go about you know, reclaiming the deep and rich meaning of Christmas yeah. while being in our culture and being part yeah. of what's going yeah. on in the world around us? Yeah. I would say in the simplest way I could say it is appreciate and enjoy all the different fun, neutral, cultural stuff, mm -hmm. but cling to Jesus. Cling to the God who came among us. Um, remember the story. Experience the presence of Jesus. And, and have fun decorating the tree and seek the face of Jesus and enjoy putting up some lights and tell the story of Jesus and have some eggnog or some hot apple cider and talk about Jesus and just keep weaving Jesus in because he is, he is um, central to all things, but especially to Christmas time. Yeah, I love yeah. that. That's a great idea. Does it bother you when people say happy holidays? Not at all. <laughs> I think that people are happy and that they enjoy the holidays is a good thing. Right. I don't, I, I, I pick my battles. Right. I know people that, you know, let's let, try this. Say happy holidays. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. <laughs> See how pleasant that is. If, if, if our, if we retaliate to happy holidays with Merry Christmas and with a snarl, mm -hmm. we're probably, we're probably really not doing much redemptive in that moment. Right. If someone's having happy holidays, I hope they have a happy holiday. Um, I greet people Merry Christmas, but I don't do it contentiously and I don't do it like I'm going to battle you and fight. Right. I just say hey, Merry Christmas to you. And if somebody says happy holidays, I'll, I'll, I'll just say, hey, same to you. Merry, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And I, but I don't do it argumentatively. And so that's not an issue for me. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Because there's things that are happening out in our culture that could be off ramps or could be obstacles that we definitely yeah. don't want to, to yeah. deal with. And I, as you said earlier, I'm a bit of a warrior. So I can yeah. say that in my yeah. time, I have had times yeah. where that has been like, wait, they're yeah. trying to steal my holiday. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, the, but I absolutely can see that it really yeah. isn't about that. They're, yeah. they're actually, most of the people I think that say happy holidays are yeah. trying to be yeah. kind and inclusive. Yeah. Like, I don't know what you celebrate. Yeah. So let me just say this because yeah. it's safe. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, are there any things that you could see that are happening in our 
world today that can help drive us back into the meaning of of Christmas. And, yeah, yeah. Well, I would say you know what you talked you asked earlier about all the angels around Christmas mm-hmm. time. The angels, uh, peace on earth, goodwill. You know the the theme that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He brings peace. Man, our world, our nation, our political system, our families need peace. We are in a in a tumultuous time of uh, just tension and turmoil. There's three T words for you: tumultuous, tension, and turmoil. But I mean, there's just so much going on that's just churning. And to just be able to walk in peace, to live in peace, and to bear the peace of Jesus, I think that opens up the door for people to see what Christmas is really about. And so I think that that's one thing in a time where there's lots of turmoil, to live in peace, to extend peace to others, and to present Jesus as the one who brings peace to our lives, that's a huge open door for the for the story of Christmas. So we've kind of gone through this, this setting of some some traditions and what's going on theologically with Christmas and something about our culture. So I just have some questions that I just want to kind of throw at you quickly and see what your thoughts are. Yeah. Um, were there three wise men at the manger? No. <laughs> three gifts, and that must be where we get three wise men. But there were not. We don't. We don't know how many wise men there were. But but there were three gifts given to Jesus. Okay. Favorite Christmas movie. I'm going to give you some choices. Okay. A Christmas Story, Elf, or It's a Wonderful Life. I'm going with Elf, oh. an instant classic, because I, I like is. to laugh. They're, they're, all, they're, they're all great movies yeah. and all have sweet moments, but I'm a, a fan of Elf. I'll give you a little like uh, sneak peek preview. Yeah. Next year for Chris, or for Halloween, yeah. I'm dressing up as Elf. There you go. I like it. Buddy, real or artificial Christmas tree? I'm going to get practical, pragmatic, and keep the carpet clean. Artificial. Uh, so I was going to ask you why. You answered yeah. it all yeah. in your answer. The original Grinch or Jim Carrey as the Grinch? I think Jim Carrey is hilarious, but I'm going with the original Grinch because I grew up with the cartoon. All right. A cold, wintry Christmas in Michigan or a warm, tropical <laughs> Christmas in Monterey? Which is your favorite? See all of the above. Okay. I'm going to play that safe because I got family <laughs> in both places and I'll, uh, you know, but, but I'm always. I'm always here for Christmas because it's the mm-hmm. highlight of the church year, but I but I I love a, a white Christmas as well. Yeah, um, most people don't know I'm from Michigan originally too, yeah. and there's just something completely different about yeah. a white Christmas. Yeah. And so even here, while we're in California, we try during the Christmas yeah. season to find ourselves yeah. somewhere yeah. in snow because there's yeah. something about yeah. that. That's yeah. and if it can snow on Christmas, even a, better. I remember yeah. one Christmas we we went out. We had a, we, the back of our uh, lot line in our home in Michigan when our boys were young was a little pond mm-hmm. and we went out and with you know with a shovel and cleared a skating rink a little hockey rink and all the boys got ice skates for christmas oh. and we went out ice skating on on christmas day that was a that was a good wintry day in your backyard in That's the backyard fantastic. yeah eggnog or hot cider no question hot cider okay. I'm, not, I'm not a nog guy i don't quite understand eggnog myself yeah it's a it's a puzzle man I, <laughs> yeah all right, so as we wrap up, would you be able to give us or would you be willing to give us a Christmas prayer or mm. blessing to, to send us off from here? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you who came among us, the incarnate God with us, we pray that, that this Christmas season and every Christmas season, we will be able to enjoy and have fun with all the things that are around Christmas, with it, whether it's decorating a tree or sharing a meal with families or getting and receiving and, and, and giving gifts and sharing with other people and just enjoying the beauty of this time of the year. But I also pray for every one of us that we would go deeper with you. We would love you more. We would recognize what Christmas is really about. And we would celebrate your presence, not just when you came 2,000 years ago, but your presence with us today. And I pray that each person listening to this podcast will have a wonderful, amazing, Merry Christmas. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun to get all those different perspectives on Christmas. Good. My joy. It was a great time. Thank you, Keith. Whether you're listening on your podcast app or watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe if you want to hear more. Thanks for listening.